So it's a dead trap because we're told that you have to continue your schooling in order to get a job that you can earn enough money to buy a house. However, the longer you stay in school, the more debt you accumulate. Welcome to Overlap, brought to you by Breakthrough News and Wave Media. My name is Rachel Hu. I'm happy to be joined today by Xiaofeng Ma, a content producer on Billy Billy, as well as Will Merrifield, the director of the Center for Social Housing and Public Investment. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Hello, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Great to have you both on. So I want to get started in this conversation with opening up about the question of homelessness, which I think is really interesting. Today we're going to talk all about the ways that housing exists in China and the way that housing exists in the U.S. And I think in the as the U.S. is in the midst of a housing crisis, there is a lot for us to dive into. So, Will, I'd love to hear from your perspective. What is the systemic issue of homelessness in the U.S.? What causes homelessness? And generally, what are people in the United States feeling uh, about the impending housing crisis that continues to loom? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a big question. Um, you know, in the United States, there's about 582,000 people that are experiencing homelessness right now. That number is probably low. Of that 586,000 people, about 60% of them reside in temporary homeless shelters and the rest sleep in the streets. The reason why I say that number is low is because the way in which homeless people are, you know, calculated, the way in which we try to account for them is municipalities, so cities across the country have these things called a point in time count, where they literally have volunteers go out and count people on the streets. So they never count, you know, all the people that are on the streets. And furthermore, aside from people who are actually experiencing homelessness in the United States, especially in our coastal cities, there is a, a lot of housing instability. So you have people who may not be technically homeless, may not be in shelters or on the streets, but they're couch surfing. They're going from place to place just trying to you know, stay off the streets. So the problem in the United States is, is really staggering. I mean, in the last few years alone in the United States, the situation has been deteriorating. I mean, I can just tell you on a personal level, you know, I work in Midtown, I, I work in Manhattan, and the homelessness issue has certainly gotten significantly worse. People are struggling. People are, are just on the streets with nowhere to go. And the city has done very little to do anything about it other than put more money into police. And really, that has not done anything other than given the police more money to harass people. It hasn't helped people. It hasn't translated into people getting housing or homes or anything like that. Really, what can you do in a short period of time is really go to a shelter. That's all you have. And what happens if you don't get into the shelters? I, I know in Alaska, actually, the shelters recently were moved outside. They got rid of the last shelter in Anchorage, which is horrific to think about because they moved everybody to a campground and they were actually being attacked attacked by bears. There is, as you said, an affordable housing crisis. As to the causes of that crisis, I would say, you know, post-2008, which was the financial crisis caused by the collapse of the mortgage industry, housing has increasingly become financialized in the United States, which is ironic because what caused that 2008 financial meltdown was the financialization of the mortgage market. So instead of learning from that catastrophe, which resulted in one of the greatest transfers of wealth um, from the 1% to the 99%, instead of learning from that, we've in the United States have doubled down on a hyper-commodified profit-driven um, housing system. And just to give you, and you know, this isn't just the United States, this is globally, especially all across Western Europe, um, to give you a little context, the global value of real estate was $326.5 trillion. I believe that was in 2021, which is four times global domestic product. So you have all this capital flooding into global real estate markets in the United States, flooding into these coastal real estate markets, and it's driving rents through the roof. Recently, 
rents in the United States, the average rent surpassed $2,000 a month for a two bedroom apartment. You just have, I think, a hyper commodified housing market, which drives rents crazy because the people who are investing in this housing are institutional Wall Street investors. And what the reason why they're investing in real estate is to maximize profit. So what gets built in the United States is things that are extremely expensive and is not rationally related to what is needed from workers on the ground. So you have luxury apartments being built in a place like Washington, D.C., which is going through a huge affordable housing crisis. We're publicly subsidizing the building of these luxury apartments, and we're not building housing that people really need. We're actually tearing down the affordable housing and privatizing our public housing stock to cater to these global investors who want to invest in very expensive housing. Certainly will. I mean, I'll say this about the U.S., which I think is an important point, too, which is that a lot of these landlords who own luxury housing, they warehouse it. I mean, not just luxury housing, public housing, affordable housing, rent stabilized complexes here in New York are warehoused by landlords, meaning that 88,000 different units here in New York, literally that are, are rent stabilized and affordable are taken off the market on purpose. So that way landlords can make more profit. And that's, uh, I think, a microcosm, a little bit of the system that we have. Even if there is something affordable, it's really not in people's hands whatsoever. So a lot of people definitely fear deeply homelessness as the crisis deepens, which is certainly an issue here. But Xiaofeng, I wanted to ask you about homelessness in China. I'm really curious to know is homelessness a, an everyday experience for people in China? Do you see a lot of homeless people in China? And it, what is the government doing to alleviate homelessness or help with the issue? Mm, to be honest, I was shocked the first time I saw so many homeless people in the U.S. online. I mean, in today's China, it's not usual to see homeless individuals, but uh, it doesn't mean that they don't exist. Based on my personal observation, the number of homeless individuals in Chinese cities is uh, relatively low. In current China, homeless people refer to those who don't have a fixed abode, who cannot rely on their relatives or friends in the big cities, and uh, difficult to ensure their basic food supply and accommodation. It's not like the peasants who lost their lands in ancient agricultural societies. They have uh, different problems. The homeless issue in China was largely attributed to the urbanization since the 21st century. And uh, these people could be divided into different categories. Some have uh, mental illness or physical disabilities, usually caused by tragic accidents and it changed the life of whole family. Apart from this, the homeless population is mainly made by another group, which is migrant workers who left their homes to earn money in the cities. When I say migrant workers, I mean domestic immigrants. Uh, it means uh, people from less developed uh, regions moving to more advanced places. Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, one of the things that I'm curious about in China to, to go a little deeper into Xiaofeng is this idea of migrants coming from the countryside into the city. Because that's, while that's a thing that happens in the U.S., I know it doesn't happen to the extent that it happens in China. So I'd love for you to share more about this because I know people in China back home in like the small countryside often own land or have family land. So I'd love for you to elaborate on this. Yes, yes. China has been an agricultural society for thousands of years. After the reform and opening up since late 1970s, there are still much more farmers in the population. The income from agricultural activities is often very limited while in their hometown. The secondary and tertiary industries do not have many job positions. So they choose to make money in the city. When it comes to homeless issue, we have to talk about domestic immigration because the main part of homeless population in China is urban workers or domestic immigrants. Uh, this is a historical problem originated from the reform and uh, opening up policy. At that time, uh, with the rapid industrialization and uh, urbanization, 
Uh, a lot of rural labor migrated uh, to big cities for more job opportunities, better education for their children. They don't expect to meet unemployment issues in big cities. So when they fail to find a job or suddenly lose their jobs, they could go back to their hometowns anytime. So um, housing and uh, renting became a huge burden at that time. But in the following two to three decades, we went through a housing reform. It has increased the supply of the uh, commercial housing. Before this reform, housing was catered by the government. However, housing supply is still limited because of the limited resource. So, with the increase of the number of houses, a significant number of people with stable incomes bought homes in the cities and it is much less likely to be homeless. Uh, on the other hand, those who couldn't afford to buy a home, as long as they have a job, they can afford to rent at least. I'm not saying that uh, we don't have unemployment here in China, but uh, it's not that difficult to find a job that can cover your daily costs, including the rent. For those migrant workers who are experiencing unemployment, we have this urban shelter system to provide temporary shelter and uh, support. Or they can choose to go back to their hometowns. The train tickets are covered by the shelter. According to the recent data, the number of people assisted was over 3.48 million in 2013. But by 2021, uh, it had reduced significantly to 830,000, which is a huge progress. Most of them have their own self-built house back in their hometowns. So they have a place to go if they failed to earn a living in big cities. There is a historical reason behind as well. During the land reform and the establishment of the hukou system, uh, we basically uh, ensure that uh, rural families could get a small piece of land on which they could uh, build their own house. The rapid economic development also contributed a lot to solving this problem. It released a large number of jobs opportunities. Almost everyone benefited from this process. So I was wondering what are the main factors lead to homelessness in the US? What is the role of your government played in this? Will, feel free to jump in and answer that. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. Um, so. There's this perception in the United States itself, and also I think globally, um, I want to really pound home, you know, the idea that the cause of homelessness in the United States is not primarily due to mental health issues or drug addiction. It really is a cost issue. So just really quickly, in Washington, D.C., the average rent for a two bedroom apartment is about $3,200 per month, which works out to about $39,000 per year. The um, minimum wage in Washington DC is about $33,000 per year. So right away, there's a $5,000 gap between what a person working a minimum wage job in Washington DC earns and what they have to pay in rent. That is before they paid for transportation costs, before they bought food, before they bought their kids clothes, you know, cared for their children. So, and in the context of this affordable housing crisis in Washington, D.C., we are tearing down the public housing and we're giving away massive amounts of public land and public money to politically connected developers to build luxury apartments that people can't afford. So just really quick, between 2002 in 2013, in Washington, D.C., we gave away $1.7 billion worth of public subsidies to private developers. And in that time frame, and we gave these public subsidies to private developers because what did they do? They promised that they were going to build housing that people could afford and that they were going to create jobs. So what we saw during that time frame was that half of the affordable units in Washington, D.C. were lost. And while half of the affordable housing units 
in Washington, D.C. during 2002 and 2013 were lost, high-end units tripled. So what these developers were doing was they were taking public subsidies, they were tearing down affordable housing, and they were replacing that affordable housing with more expensive housing so that they could maximize their profits. And that is what is really driving the affordable housing crisis, not only in Washington, D.C., but in municipalities and cities all across the country. Will, I really appreciate that. I think that's an important point. But I'd love for you to talk a little bit more, Will, about the situation for home ownership. Because I think one of the things that's really important about the market right now in the U.S. is that especially young people really look at the future and say, I don't think I could ever own a home, which was always a big, you know, sold as a big part of the American dream, that you can own your own home, you can have your own backyard, white picket fence. And that's really not the, re uh, the situation now, especially for young people and millennials who are now pushing 40 um, who will not be able to own their own homes. So I'd love for you to speak on, on, on this experience and this situation and, and kind of the outlook for what a lot of people feel for the future. Yeah, sure. I mean, home ownership is, like you said, Rachel, it's out of reach for a lot of young people in the United States. In the United States, um, you know, debt, our, our economy is built a lot on debt. So a lot of students are graduating college in obscene amounts of debt. If you go want to get a degree beyond a four-year university degree, then you get into more debt. So it's a debt trap because we're told that you have to continue your schooling in order to get a job, that you can earn enough money to buy a house. However, the longer you stay in school, the more debt you accumulate. On top of that, the as we've been talking about, the commodification of the housing market has driven not only rental costs, but housing costs, home purchase costs through the roof. In Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, the median home value just surpassed $1 million. So think about, and I will say that the, the median income in the United States, I believe, is about $44,000. So just think about that. Um, there is very little space for people to be able to you know, afford homes in this market. Um, and what does that do? It drives more people into the rental market. And what does that do? It drives up housing costs. Um, so you can see that the system in the United States is, uh, it feeds into itself. And the people that are benefiting from all these different things that we're talking about is Wall Street, is the big banks, because they own these assets and they are, you know, they're getting rent from us and we're not able to purchase, we're not able to own. That's the situation in the United States. And I think that it's important to complicate that question of homelessness. So Xiaofeng, I'd love to hear your thoughts on some of this and, and learning more about the housing crisis in the U.S. I have an impression that uh, the big companies, big capitalists uh, are highly controlled by the U.S. government. Um, for example, you have a very strict anti-monopoly laws, but what you just said made me feel that the Wall Street could basically do whatever they want. It seems that they could push up the house pricing unlimitedly. In China, when talking about the housing problem, uh, usually it refers to purchasing an apartment uh, rather than renting one, because here in China, as long as uh, you have a job, no matter how much you earn, at least you could find a shelter. That's the main difference between the US and China. For Chinese people, the pressure is mainly from actually buying a house for ourselves. Although we don't have that much homeless population, we are still on the way to solve the housing problem. Although the housing reform has largely increased the supply of uh, commodity housing, it also caused some housing problems. For example, the pricing of housing was pushed up and up and up. Under the Chinese culture, newly married couples must own an apartment. So you could uh, imagine how much pressure is on uh, young people nowadays in order to purchase a home for the new couple. At least six pockets would be empty in Chinese family, including the pocket of the bride, the groom, and the, both of their big families. 
Uh, when it comes to housing price control, uh, it's a bit complicated here in China. The central government always uh, pursue uh, to control the housing price under an adequate level. Um, but for local governments, as land transaction is their major income source, uh, they have great interest in the housing industry, you know. However, if they keep doing this kind of transaction, they will make the housing price up and up and up. So basically, there is a contradiction between the central and the local governments. As a result, uh, in order to mitigate this issue, the central government is taking various different measures to control the housing price, including providing low-rent apartments and uh, so on. You know, one of the things I'm thinking as we're having this conversation is just about where we see this crisis going. Yeah, it is uh, a dire situation right now. It seems as though the only solution that elected officials have in the United States is to throw more public money and more public land into the private market to private developers. And the idea is that they'll build, build, build. And at some point there will be a trickle down effect and rents will come down. But what we've seen in reality is the opposite of that. The more public resources that we shovel into the private market, the more rents go up. There are a lot of sophisticated reasons for that. But um, I think the, you know, you had talked about earlier, landlords are, or developers are building apartments and strategically keeping units offline to keep rents high. There was a really interesting ProPublica study um, that just came out about a month ago that talked about a specific algorithm that especially Wall Street owned housing projects are using that tells them when to keep housing off the market. So we're giving our public money to the private sector and we're saying build housing so rents come down and they're building housing to increase their profits and they're actually raising rents. Over, there's been a huge housing boom in Washington, D.C. Um, and over the last 10 years, rents have risen by 55%. So what we can plainly see is that what we're doing is not working. However, there is there are movements across the country. People are fighting back. Tenants are organizing. And one of the most um, hopeful things that I think is, is happening in the U.S. is this growing idea of this concept of social housing in the United States. And social housing is the way I think about it. There's actually a bill in Washington, D.C. right now that calls for the building of municipally owned mixed income housing that is self-sustaining and pays for itself. And the way it works is that government looks at housing as infrastructure. It builds housing. Unlike traditional public housing, where it was only very impoverished people that were able to live in it, this sort of public type of public housing has a mix of incomes. And because there's a mix of incomes in the housing, the rents paid are able to cover the operating cost of the, the apartment complex. And the surplus rent at the end of the month, the rent that's left over after all the tenants have paid their rent and the place is upkept, that surplus rent is actually used to pay down the construction cost of the housing. So this model is a decommodified outside the private market, a public form of housing that allows housing to be accessed by a broad spectrum of people. And I think would do would, would provide in essence a public option for people. So if they don't want to be exploited by the private market, they could rent, they could choose a public option and um and pay much less rent. That model is based on the model in Vienna, Austria, where that's a municipality of about 1.9 million people, they have 420,000 units of social housing. Half of their housing stock is made up of social housing and about 80% of their population qualify to live in that social housing. So they've removed the stigma of public housing. They've made this public housing extraordinarily popular among their residents. So the government can't cut funding for it. Um, and they've created a public option to drive down costs. And I think that in order to solve the affordable housing crisis, we, we're gonna have to look to 
decommodified forms of housing. Like I said, there's a public housing bill that is proposed in Washington, D.C. There's one that's been proposed in California. There is public housing or a social housing bill that's been proposed in Maryland. I know there's a growing social housing movement in New York. So I think that there are, you know, hopeful, hopeful things um, into the future. But I think what's important about the United States is to understand that these things are going to have to happen at a municipal level in cities across the country, because what we see from our federal government is that they're not ready for the moment. They're not prepared to take on Wall Street and banks. And in order to grow these alternative housing models, I think we're going to have to do so through local organizing um, in cities and municipalities across the United States. But it's happening. Certainly will. I really appreciate your insights. And I, I think just what I want to end this conversation on is just drawing off of what Xiaofeng was sharing about the Chinese model. I, I think it's just important for people in the United States especially to look around and see that there are other options. I mean, it's really exciting to think about drawing on these different models that incorporate, especially for where we are now in the U.S., options for public housing, social housing, and really building the, into the idea, into the consciousness that we have the right to a home. And I think that especially the the what was done in the, the early days of the Chinese revolution, um, as Xiaofeng mentioned, can be really a, a model for us to think about. Can I just make one last point? Yes. I think, especially for the audience in the United States, I want to drive home the idea that Wall Street and hedge funds are not going to save us. They are not going to solve our affordable housing crisis because their model is to extract, is to extract wealth from the working class and give that wealth to the 1%. What we need is public investment, public investment from our government, our government using our tax dollars, using our public land to invest in public institutions that build strong communities because the, 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 the increased financialization, it is wholly dependent on Wall Street and hedge funds. And we will only dig ourselves into a deeper hole if we continue to rely on that model. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. All right. Take care. Thank you.